Dana Plato was TV's first bad girl. Dana was a ball of energy. It's an effervescence that I've never seen before. If she couldn't get attention as a star, then she unconsciously sought attention for negative things. She just smoked crack cocaine and on pills. She went from different strokes to soft porn. When Dana robbed the video store, I just believed there was a cry for help. The end was definitely the roughest. Dana Plato, at the height of her career, never thought that she would become Dana Plato. Someone should have paid attention to what happened to Dana Plato. Just wanted to know how it felt to be in for today. I'm sorry, Michael. Dana Plato was TV's first bad girl. And it is a cautionary tale for young Hollywood today who thinks that they can get away with anything and always will be able to. There are so many current starlets who would do well by studying the trajectory of Dana Plato's life because they are at the beginning of the end, uh, just as Dana Plato was. And all they have to do is look at Dana Plato's steep decline into pornography and drugs and eventually suicide to say, whoa, maybe I better pay attention to what happened to this really adorable young girl. Paris Hilton, Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, Nicole Richie, Anna Nicole, and Nobody thinks that it'll happen to them. You know, they're so caught up in the glamour of it all or the drama of it all that um, they can't even look to learn from these lessons. Perhaps if they had, there wouldn't have been scenes like this. Nicole Richie's DUI, driving the wrong way on the highway. Nicole Richie is headed to jail. Could Lindsay Lohan be next? It turns out virtually everything about Dana Plato's life could have taught us something about fame. If she couldn't get attention as a star, the way she did when she was a child star, then she unconsciously sought attention for negative things, for all the different problems that she got herself into. To watch people talk about you, ridicule you, and insult you when they have no idea who you are, it's, it's bad. A major problem with child stars is that they are surrounded by enablers, starting with their own family, who are exploiting them for uh, fame or for money or for glamour. Seeing the pressures of Dana's life, we might have seen the slide into addiction. Dana's drugs were cocaine, uh, pot, a lot of pot. She just smoked crack cocaine and on pills. And it got a real hold on her. When she could afford cocaine, then after cocaine, it went down to crack. So that was really the ruination of her. And through it all, we'd have learned about the frantic search of so many stars for love. It's very hard if you're a parent dependent upon the income of your child because the child realizes that they're the breadwinner and they no longer feel loved for who they are, but rather for the money and the attention and the fame that they're bringing into the family. And finally, we'd see that it all led to loss. She was supposed to be back on Mother's Day and she never came back. Dana Plato was just 35 years old when she died, gaunt and haunted. It was a shocking end for a woman who once had the brightest of futures, who lit up every room she entered. It's an effervescence that I've never seen before. Ever. Dana was a ball of energy, just like, just complete energy when she came in the room and it was like a light came to the door. She would actually come in the front door of the offices and do cartwheels right down to my office. <laughs> And then she'd poke her head around the corner and say, hi, Colleen. She was the quintessential all-American girl, a vibrant, freckle-faced, innocent-looking sprite of a child who popped in the door of a Hollywood agent and changed her own destiny. I could see a very magical little face. I mean, just extraordinary. So I called the mother and I said, um, I'd like to see Dana on such and such a date. 
Within months after signing with a powerful new agent, Dana Plato would capture the role of Kimberly Drummond and the hearts of Americans when she stepped on the set of Different Strokes. I read with Dana. And um, right off the bat, I knew she was Kimberly Drummond. And, um, you know, I looked at Albert, and I was like, that's, that's Kimberly Drummond. That's our sister. It has to be. And um, sure enough, she got the part. On November 3rd, 1978, Americans turned on their television sets to be greeted by a show unlike any they'd ever seen before. The story about a wealthy white father and his pretty young daughter adopting the two black orphans of the housekeeper seemed to touch a national nerve. And it really brought America to where, you know, two black kids were hugging a white man saying, I love you, changed America. It was like the sun, the moon, and the stars came together when different strokes came on the air. It was an instant, instant hit. It was really a pinnacle show for America at the time because we were struggling with race relations really hard in America in the 70s, and that show really, really changed you know, how we saw each other. The show would also change the lives of its young stars. But from the highs of different strokes, they would plummet to lows no one could have imagined. In the end, the child stars of different strokes would pay an enormous price for their fame. Well, the curse of different strokes is that all three kids ended up in a lot of trouble. Each of the young stars would ultimately face extraordinary turmoil. Dana Plato would face it all. Alcohol and drug addiction, bankruptcy and intense humiliation. When you think of it, she went from different strokes to soft porn. Now that's a really big leap, but that's where she went. That's what happens, drugs and alcohol. You know, cocaine, pot, alcohol, that's where it takes you. Which caused her husband to then leave her and take her son with him. At that point, she was so um, devastated by drug and alcohol abuse that she was not really able to work. Behind Dana Plato's public story is a private tragedy, a heartbreaking tale of abandonment, loss, and desperation. Dana Plato was looking for love in all the wrong places, and in the end, she would die looking frantically for something she would never find. It was November 7, 1964. It was a day when the sky was a deep, clear blue and the sun seemed brighter than ever. Inside a California hospital, Linda Strain gave birth to a baby girl she never held or saw. If she had, she says, she could never have given her up. That baby girl would be Dana Plato. Linda was 16 at the time. She'd already had one child, I believe, and that it was just too much for her to take care of a second child. She was just too young. And it was then that um, Kay and Dean adopted Dana. Miles away in Montebello, California, Dean and Kay Plato were overjoyed to finally have a beautiful, bright-eyed baby. New mother Kay lavished Dana with affection. Kay loved Dana. It was just Dana was her life. Ultimately, I mean, there was just nothing or anyone else in her life, really, that mattered as much as her daughter. But eventually, even her husband seemed not to matter as much. When Dana was just three, her father moved out. The little girl was crushed. When little girls are abandoned by their fathers, they um, feel like damaged goods. They feel like no man would ever love them for who they are. They feel that they're not lovable. The parents who adopted her, who would have told her that she was special and they chose her and um, wanted her, obviously then when her father left her at approximately age three or four, she couldn't believe that anymore. Left alone to raise Dana, Kay tried hard to give her a normal life but she soon discovered she didn't exactly have a normal little girl. She could sing, she could dance, she was funny. Everything about her was special because she could do anything. Tap dance, ballet, ice skate, Olympics, could have been an Olympic skater. She uh, could sing, she could do it all. 
When she was seven, Dana persuaded her mother to let her try modeling and acting. When little children clamor to be in front of the camera, it's because they're not getting enough love and attention at home. And because they are trying to get the love and attention from the camera, from the audience, from the applause. Right from the start, the charming little girl was a stunning success. She was quickly cast in dozens of commercials and began to win movie roles as well. She played Wendy in Beyond the Bermuda Triangle and appeared in Return to Bogey Creek. But it was auditioning for the gong show that her life changed. Different Strokes came about with a casting session. Al Burton, who was the executive producer person, um, spotted Dana and he said, I don't want to book her on this show. I have something else in mind. So he brought her back for that something else in mind, and that something else in mind was Different Strokes. Dana was cast as Kimberly Drummond, the only child of a wealthy widower played by Conrad Bain. He adopts the two African-American sons of his housekeeper, who has recently died. Hi there. Hi. Hi, metal mouth. <laughs> We've just met and already he's insulting me like a real brother. <laughs> By the way, guys, stay out of my room or I'll punch you out. The show premiered the night of November 3rd, 1978. And from that moment on, there would be no turning back. Oh, the excitement was just beyond all, all get out. I mean, I was thrilled. I was thrilled. Um, I think that we all negated to think D is this really what Dana wanted? Oh, my goodness. You couldn't even go anywhere with her. It was a nightmare sometimes to even go anywhere with her, that she wouldn't be recognized and people want her autograph and want to talk to her and want to take her picture and have their picture made with her. By all accounts, the early years on different strokes were happy ones. The stunning success of the show, even charming Nancy Reagan. The camaraderie among the cast, particularly the three child stars, Dana, Gary Colbin, and Todd Bridges made it a heady time for 13-year-old Dana Plato. I'm sure for so many years, she was really happy. She loved attention. So when you're on a show, you're getting attention from millions of people. Working on the set of Different Strokes was always a lot of fun. It was, um, the first three years were where the fun was. She loved Todd, she loved Gary, she loved, um, Conrad Bain, she, she loved working on the show. We, uh, as kids, did a lot of things together. We had lunch together, we had breakfast together, we had dinner together, we, um, would go bowling together, we'd go sh do a lot of things together after the show, during the show. We'd go to each other's houses for parties. The three young co-stars of Different Strokes bonded quickly living out their childhood years on a sound stage. We all loved the roller skate. That was the era of the roller skating where it became very big, and we used to roller skate around the studio, me, Dana, and, uh, and Gary. We'd roller skate like crazy around everywhere. But reality soon began to intrude on the charmed world at different strokes. For Dana, it would come with a vengeance. The diagnosis of her beloved mother, Kay, with an agonizing and ultimately fatal disease, scleroderma that hardens the skin and shuts down blood vessels. Kay, who was dying, decided to tell her daughter the brutal truth and to prepare Dana for life without her. Kay wasn't always feeling great, so, you know, Dana felt abandoned was because her mother was ill. And then she's, you know, she's gonna pass away, and then, you know, you're gonna feel more abandonment issues. Even though she was young when she uh, was on Different Strokes, she already had so many uh, personal family problems that any one of which would have been devastating for a child. Being adopted, having a father leave you at age three, having a mother with a terminal illness. I mean, it was just overwhelming. The pressure began to take a toll. As her mother spent more and more time in hospitals, Dana did more and more of whatever she pleased. The combination of too much money and freedom would prove to be dangerous. Kay absolutely did spoil her. To the end, she gave her everything. Everything. I mean, anything that Dana wanted, she got. I remember plenty of times Dana would come over to the house and late at night, you know, and you'd go, or you'd go to Dana's house and there'd be nobody there, just Dana. She was smoking pot early on. She was drinking early on. Friends at the time say her drinking and pot smoking began at about 13. Her behavior on the set, always professional before that, began to change. 
By the time she was 14, the bright-eyed all-American girl with a limitless future was heading for serious trouble. It's interesting now when you pull back the veil and see what was happening to Dana Plato while she was actually on the show. I mean, you didn't realize there's this sort of delightful, charismatic, jovial girl who is already at 12 and 13 years old drinking and 14 years old trying to commit suicide. So there's the public persona, there's the character that comes through on television, and, and then there's this private life. In the early 1980s, at the height of her fame, vibrant young Dana Plato was making nearly $25,000 a week. Oh, without you. In addition to her role on Different Strokes, Dana was a much sought after spokesperson for national products like Noxzema. The best way to fight acne is to fight it day and night. But who has time? During the day, I'm busy. And at night, I'm asleep. So I'm glad there's new Noxzema 12 hour acne medicine. The striking young woman had become a role model for teenage girls all across America and a heartthrob for teenage boys. But Dana's life was quietly spiraling out of control behind the scenes. Coping with nearly instant stardom, a terminally ill mother, and all the strains of adolescence, Dana took a step that would offer a chilling glimpse of her future and of her desperate need for attention. Dana did attempt to take her life at 14. I believe it was an overdose of Valium. But she did it while her friends were in the house. If she really wanted to do it, she would have done it alone. The children just came running down the stairs. They met three, four, five of her friends. And they're all screaming that Dana, um, Dana had taken these pills. Anyway, we got her to a hospital and had a tummy pump. And in no time at all, the press got hold of it. And we're trying to hush it up. We're trying to keep it quiet. They found out. I believe that that was the beginning. I believe that was the beginning of her, of her change, her disappearing, her acting up on the set, her not showing up on call time at the correct time. Kimberly, what is the matter? Don't worry, Mr. D. She ain't got a hangover. <laughs> I'm okay, Daddy. I'm just tired. I was up practically all night long studying. Dana's muted cries for help would become virtual screams as the young teen began experimenting with cigarettes, alcohol, sex, and drugs. Dana's drugs were cocaine, pot, a lot of pot. Dana, I tried, when I first started pot, it was with Dana. She introduced me to pot, you know, and I'll never forget that. I wish I had never done that, I tried that. Eventually, Dana's behavior began to affect life on the set. We call her, she was the um, amazing Dana, because she would disappear on you. For instance, we'd be shooting a scene and we're doing a scene and we're like talking and I'm saying my line and Gary says his line and we're like, that's supposed to be Dana's line. Go, Where's Dana? Dana? And she's gone. She was there one minute, gone the next. I guess she was smoking pot on the set. I mean, I think it's so ironic that you have a sitcom in which you know, everybody's basically happy and gets along and it's loving and... Everybody's sitting on everybody's lap, and Dad is so wonderful. And then behind the scenes of this sitcom, these child actors are really falling apart. In 1983, the free-spirited young actress began dating an aspiring rock star, Lanny Lambert. And it was then that Dana began to balk at the demands of life on a sitcom. You know, she came to a point in her life that she wanted total freedom. She said, Joni, I am so sick. I don't want to have to do anything anymore. I want my space. I want to go out in the wilderness, and I want to go to the meadows, and I want to go entertain myself. But Dana's bid for freedom with her boyfriend, Lanny, would turn instead into a lifetime commitment. Dana got pregnant, and in April of 1984, she and Lanny married in Las Vegas. I tried to stop it in the beginning. I told him, my son, he was entirely too young to get married. And I told her, and she said, no, there's no stopping us getting together. Three months after her wedding, on July 2nd, 1984, 
19-year-old Dana Plato gave birth to a baby boy, Tyler. The beautiful young actress was elated. Oh, she was happy. Oh, my goodness, she was happy. It was the happiest day of her life. She was just thrilled to death. She was a wonderful mother. All said and done, she was a wonderful mother. She loved that little boy. She doted on him. But as much as she loved Tyler, Dana had neglected to consider the impact her pregnancy would have on her career. She's the star of a TV show, 18 or 19 years old, and she gets pregnant. And I think I read that she told her co-star, Conrad Bain, guess what, I'm going to have a baby. And he said, do you really want to have a baby at this time of your life? Because he understood. He understood that her pregnancy meant that she would be gone from the show, and that's exactly what happened. Dana's character, Kimberly Drummond, was sent off to Paris to study with the understanding that she would return from time to time. Firing her was the worst thing they ever did. They, when they fired her, that was a death of Dana. Emotional. From that point on, Dana Plato's life would become a series of personal dramas, with few, if any, professional successes. Dana, without the routine and attention of different strokes, was lost. See, one of the things about um, kids like Dana, who are very troubled, uh, but have a structured life, a structured either school life, or she was structured on a set, they can somehow keep it together. But once the structure is gone, she was no longer able to keep her life together. When people grow up with holes or an emptiness inside of them, they look for things to fill it. In Dana's case, she began uh, filling it with stardom from a very early childhood age. The applause, the lights, and when that died, she then looked for other things to fill it. Uh, alcohol, drugs, anything for attention. Soon, Dana had begun to leave home, partying all night, often with former cast member Todd Bridges, while neglecting her young son and terrifying her husband. You know, we did cocaine together. We did stuff, drugs after the show was over. We did drugs together. Then she'd get hysterical over nothing and run down the boulevard naked, just out of control. Dana being wild herself, you know, she was hard to handle. And I'm sure Lanny had a tough time with her. At just 20, Dana, married, and a new mother seemed to be hurtling toward oblivion. Lanny called me and said, Mom, you got to get down here. Dana just jumped through the window, the plate glass window. Oh, my gosh. In 1985 and 86, Dana returned to different strokes for a few episodes. But her husband, Lanny, worn down, had had enough. He took their son and left California. It would be the show's last season and Tyler's first real memory of his mother. I'd have to say is I saw her on TV when I was young. And my dad told me, you know, about it. I knew what was going on, but when I actually saw her, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. Good feeling. They say when an alcoholic or addict is in the throes of addiction, their world gets smaller and smaller until there is nothing left but the substance they crave. Left without her husband or child, and with her own mother desperately ill, Dana Plato withdrew from the world. The bright-eyed child star, who had once worked 12-hour days, five days a week, was now living like a recluse. Never changing clothes, eating, or talking to another human being. The little girl with all the potential in the world had hit rock bottom. But in 1987, Dana would be forced to confront both real and imagined demons. By December 1987, Dana Plato had fallen so far, gone so deeply into the clutches of her addiction, that she would actually enter her beloved mother's hospital room and scream at her to hurry up and die. I don't think that was Dana. I think there was some sort of boogeyman inside of her. Drugs and alcohol, or call it what you want. 
But Dana, who uttered those words, was in fact terrified of losing the one person she trusted in all the world. There were times that, um, that I know that Dana would just curl up and into bed with her mum and they'd just both watch television together and she would do that until Kay couldn't. Dana, who basically lost her father in 1984 when he unsuccessfully sued her for financial support, would finally lose her mother too. In January of 1988, Kay Plato would die of scleroderma. The key word to understanding Dana Plato is abandonment. She was abandoned by her biological parents, abandoned by her father, her adoptive parents divorced. So throughout her life, she had this series of abandonments, which left an incredible aching hole inside of her. By now, the lonely child star was a largely unemployable adult. And she easily uh, was forgotten by people who could employ her and grabbed at, desperately, any project she could get. In June of 1989, Dana's fans could open an issue of Playboy magazine and see the innocent little girl they'd welcomed into their living rooms in a series of revealing photos. They capitalized on her sexuality, which is exactly what the public did not want to see. They wanted to see her as this cute, freckle-faced little girl who was sitting on the lap of her daddy. Dana's risk would prove to be Dana's disaster. The combination of the Playboy photos, rumors of drug use, and wild behavior had turned her into a Hollywood pariah. In March of 1990, after her husband divorced her and won custody of their son, a shaken Dana decided to leave California. She went straight to Las Vegas, a town fueled by as much desperation as she was. But even in the midst of her growing addiction, Dana tried hard to maintain a relationship with her beloved son, Tyler, who would visit often. She was great. She was my best friend. Me and my mom had a relationship where I could tell her anything. And she'd tell me anything. With no other skills and a limited education, Dana took a job as a cashier at a dry cleaner. The girl who had been earning up to $25,000 an episode at age 14 was now earning $200 a week and being ridiculed for doing it. You have to just, that's what comes on with the territory. You have to accept it. Any job that I work at, people are gonna make fun of me. Oh, you're nobody, man. Look, oh, you used to be somebody. You're, you know, that's what we have to deal with. It was a far cry from the bright lights and big money Dana Plato once had. And hers was a bleak and lonely life. She spent most of her time in neighborhood bars, slipping deeper and deeper into a vortex of drugs and alcohol. Finally, after almost a year, Dana snapped. 911, what's your emergency? When Dana robbed the uh, video store in 1991, I just believed there was a cry for help. On February 28th, 1991, Dana, garbed in black, stepped into a Las Vegas video store and behaving as if she had a gun, asked the clerk to give her all her money. The clerk handed over $164, and Dana quickly left the store. Well, she claimed that she needed money. Her grandmother lived a couple of miles from there. I don't know why she wouldn't have gone there. I don't know why she wouldn't have contacted me. There's no way Kimberly Drummond can rob a little store or rob somewhere in a video store and no one's like, I know who she is. The clerk did recognize Dana and called 911 saying, I've just been robbed by the girl who played Kimberly on different strokes. Strangely, 15 minutes later, Dana came back to the store. She was promptly arrested and charged with armed robbery. Smile. He has not candid cameras for sure. No. <laughs> Swept along by a wave of reporters, 26-year-old Dana Plato was taken to the Clark County Detention Center. Please, the court, I represent Ms. Plato. This is the time set for preliminary hearing. Her bail was set for $13,000. It was money she didn't have. Yes. Wayne Newton was um, actually bailed her out. June 6th, 10 a.m., Department 9. Wayne Newton, bless his heart. Just wanted to know how it felt to be in for today. I'm sorry. She just wanted some help, wanted somebody to pay attention to her. 
you know, to show her that, that they loved her. It could well be the reason why she chose a video store to rob, hoping that a clerk in a video store would be more likely to recognize her than someone in a grocery store, for example, and that then she might get the help that she needed in that this was partially a cry for help and also she would get the recognition. In the end, the former child star got what many considered a lenient sentence. Five years of probation. I feel lucky to have had the opportunity to get into recovery and get better, or get well, I should say. And I feel lucky to have experienced everything that I have. But Todd Bridges, Dana's Different Strokes co-star, who is clean and sober today, feels that Dana's sentence was too easy. Unfortunately, Dana got, got out of it so fast that she didn't know that there had to be a change in her life, that she had to make a difference. And um, for an addict, he just takes... Um, he has to learn the hard way. For the better part of her life, Dana Plato, it seemed, had been desperately seeking to fill a void. In November of 1991, Dana began to search for her birth parents. And in December of that year, Dana Plato would finally meet the woman who gave birth to her. On December 2nd, 1991, Dana Plato, under the familiar gaze of TV cameras and with the help of an adoption agency named International Locators, finally met the birth mother who had given her up for adoption 27 years earlier. Well, she was all happy at first. Oh, guess what, Joni? I'm going to meet my, my mother. Their joyous reunion soon inspired a commercial. Are you the person who gave up a baby for adoption and has wondered ever since what ever happened to that child? When I came back on, she said, uh, my daughter's an actress. Dana would quickly discover that she had a ready-made biological family who welcomed her with open arms. At first, she kept in touch with them. But less than a year later, she abruptly cut off all contact with no explanation. She said, Joni, I'm so sorry I did that. She said she didn't want me, and Kay did. And that was really my mother. She said, I don't, I don't ever want to see her again. By January of 1992, Dana was adrift and casting about once again. She came to Oklahoma and I thought, maybe she's had enough and she's going to straighten up. Next thing I know, I had a call from the district attorney. Dana had flown to Oklahoma, stolen her former father-in-law the doctor's prescription pad, and forged prescriptions of 100 Valium with 10 refills and returned to Las Vegas. This time... She turned herself in. Is she going to make it this time? She better make it. I'm going to make sure and do everything yeah. that I can do to make her make it. This time, she faced new charges of forgery and violation of parole. She still had four years of probation to serve for her armed robbery charges of less than a year earlier. Dana's life had become completely unmanageable. And I went to her trial to help her out in Vegas when I was kind of on shaky ice try to help her so she wouldn't go to jail. Miraculously, Dana walked away with back-to-back -back sentences of five years probation. And once again, critics claim the sentence was a lenient one because of her fame. When you're addicted to something like drugs or alcohol, you do things that are not in your nature. And I really think that people that have an addiction problem should be able to get some help. I really do, rather than just going to prison. And for a brief shining moment in April of 1992, Dana Plato did seem better. She performed for the first time in nearly six years. Not a scratch. Just look at my nails. Appearing as a showgirl in the review Tropical Heat in Las Vegas. But she fell just as quickly after only four months. The show abruptly ended. A brief succession of B-movies followed. Then, on October 15th, 1992, Dana appeared in a video game called Night Trap that was so degrading and so violent, it not only enraged loyal fans, but it helped spark congressional hearings on violence in videos. Night Trap was developed specifically for an adult audience. MA-17, not appropriate for children. Mired in controversy, Dana then even tried appearing on stage, but nothing, it seemed, could reignite her smoldering career. It becomes a spiral downward when the child star becomes notorious, they become less desirable 
in any kind of uh, television or film project. And she easily uh, was forgotten by people who could employ her. Hers had become a lonely, isolated life, and Dana missed her son, Tyler. She decided to return to Oklahoma to live with Tyler and her ex-husband. And this time, she had a new plan. She was going to be this textbook mom. Oh, she was normal. She gave Tyler the best, probably the best year of his life. She would take me to school, and then she'd come pick me up, go home, just have some family time, and then, you know, just tuck me in the bed and did it all the next day. But as hard as she tried, Dana couldn't keep it up. A year after she'd come home, Dana was lured away again, back to the empty promise of Hollywood. She would stop, and people would take photographs and autographs, and she'd love that, being recognized. She, she, she would use a big light. She'd just big grin on her face. She just loved, loved the tension. Without work, family, or any structure, Dana began to deteriorate again, flirting from man to man and reportedly sometimes from woman to woman. By 1996, Dana no longer bothered to hide her habits from 12-year-old Tyler. That's when I started to mature a little bit and see a problem and semi-understand what was going on. It was smoke crack cocaine and on pills. And that's when really started getting bad. She just did not look good at all. The house was a mess. And, you know, I found little rocks on the bathroom floor and stuff like that. She got so different. You know, she went to a whole different person. In 1997, a far different person than her fans had ever imagined appeared in a soft core video. There was Dana, flaunting her sexuality in the snidely titled Different Strokes, the story of Jack and Jill and Jill. She played a lesbian involved in a sex triangle. You feel, uh, you feel really warm. Mm. Feels good to cuddle like this, doesn't it? Gone was the bright-eyed young girl who had graced people's living rooms for nearly eight years in the real different strokes. In her place was a desperate young woman on a tragic downward spiral. Are these really cautionary tales? Marilyn Monroe, is she a cautionary tale? Anna Nicole Smith, is she a cautionary tale? You know, Dana Plato, is she a cautionary tale? Thanks to the new... Okay, what? How about, how about, how about my mom and dad's house? They're not again, boy, she's not breathing. Dana Plato. For the people who loved her, watching Dana Plato's final days was like watching a car accident right before it happens. We're trying CPR, we're not getting anything, we're not getting a pulse, we're not getting nothing. It's not accidental when you're an addict, it's just... Which day will it happen? But before it all ended, there would be one last gasp, one last flirtation with death, and one last attempt at stardom. In the fall of 1998, friend and former child star himself, Johnny Whitaker, offered to manage Dana if she promised to stay clean and sober. I wanted to give her the benefit of the doubt because, Unfortunately, a lot of people don't trust addicts and alcoholics, as, well, they shouldn't, so I gave her the benefit of the doubt. Thrilled and hopeful, Dana agreed to stay clean and eagerly went to get new headshots. One of the things that struck me about her was completely how alive she was in front of the camera, how professional, how connected she was. The pictures would capture Dana's essence in a way that had not been seen in years in a way that would never be seen again. She did tell me that the pictures, she felt they really represented her and her true soul. During her photo session, Dana chatted happily, proudly about Tyler. She talked about him so much and, and she loved him so much. That was really honestly what she talked about for a good part of the day. And then Dana left the photo studio she left Los Angeles and she disappeared. I said, Tyler, this is Johnny Whitaker. I'm your mom's manager. All I want to know is that Dana's okay. It is, well, my mom is here and she's fine, but she doesn't want anybody to know where she is. 
Dana eventually found her way back to Oklahoma. There, she met Robert Menchaca in a bar and within days was engaged to him. With her last dollars from a childhood trust fund, Dana bought the two a motorhome and reportedly began buying drugs. The end was definitely the roughest. I mean, there was a situation in my grandmother's house. We walked into the back room and she was on her back gargling. It's called death rattles. You know what I mean? I think she'd taken too many pills. I don't know. I don't know what was going on. She might have been on a bender and up for a couple days and just fully knocked out. I just screamed at Tyler. I said, oh, my God, help me. I, and her eyes were rolled back in her head. But she was out of it, gone. I ran with her in the shower and turned the shower on her, and she just woke up like that. She just woke up. And like nothing had ever happened. In the spring of 1999, Dana would be called to New York by an event promoter who wanted her to promote a concert on the Howard Stern show. She agreed. What happened to her on Howard Stern, it happens a lot on Howard Stern, would be different guess. But you have to be ready for it. She was supposed to be back on Mother's Day, or the day before Mother's Day. On May 7th, 1999, Dana Plato went on the show. She was excited, hoping to be welcomed back to public life. Instead, she was humiliated. Every aspect of her life ridiculed. Get this girl out of here. She's a has been. Oh, please. Come on. Well, oh. She just needs to admit that she's an ex-druggie, yeah. ex-con, lesbian with mental health problems. The more Dana talked, the more she lied. Dana, when she got on there and she goes, she's never done cocaine. I'm thinking to myself, I'm listening to the show going, Dana, I've done so much cocaine with you. Why would you lie and say you've never done cocaine? Todd Bridges who's been clean and sober for 14 years now, believes that had Dana been honest, she might have at least earned the compassion of listeners. In fact, callers were so hard on Dana that even Howard Stern seemed bothered. Oh. Just so many rumors swirling. I've never, I've never met anybody so confident. You know how hard it is for me to go through life? You don't even know. Oh, I bet you I do know. It seems to me like everybody's uh, attacking That's you. the Howard Stern show, that really ripped her up. She, she called me after that. And she was so crying so hard. Dana was never good at taking criticism, never good at, um, you know, taking the abuse that she was going to take on that show. I didn't dream she was going to go home and die. And she was so, hum she said, Joni, I've never been so humiliated in all my life. A shattered Dana flew straight back to Oklahoma. On Saturday, May 8th, exhausted and depressed, she told her fiancé that she was going to lie down in their trailer for a while. It was the day before Mother's Day. Tyler was at home, waiting for a call that would never come. She said, Tyler, I'll, I will call you. He waited all day for her call. And here, there he is with her Mother's Day gift, expecting her to call any minute. Okay, what? I'm at my mom and dad's leaving. Dana Plato. We're not getting a phone, we're not getting nothing. Come on, Dana. <laughs> Come on. Finally, former child actress Dana Plato has died of a drug overdose in Oklahoma. Initial media reports stated that Dana died of an accidental overdose of a painkiller Lortab and Valium. Authorities called the death of the 34-year-old Plato an apparent accident. But later, a medical examiner concluded that the cause of death was suicide. It was a ruling no one who knew Dana well agreed with. I don't think she committed suicide. I don't at all. That wasn't her. Most addicts, you know, we're not trying to commit suicide. We're trying to get loaded. You know, and upon trying to get loaded, you just don't know how much you're taking. She was too happy, go lucky, and she, went, she didn't want to die. In the end, Dana Plato got the one thing she had searched for all her life. Tragically, however, it would be at her memorial service. We did have a media frenzy outside. We had a full house. About three or four hundred people had come. Uh, many friends from uh, Hollywood. Uh, many friends from television and film. And it was a beautiful thing. Finally in death, at last, the sweet and fragile star was lavished with praise and affection. And there at her memorial service, taped as she would have wanted by the Lisa show, was her beautiful legacy. Her devoted son, Tyler. I'd just like to say that I loved her a whole lot, and I'm really going to miss her.
And that's it.